Hey guys, in today's video we're going to be taking an in-depth look into the Overwolf platform from the perspective of a developer. Now I myself have developed Overwolf applications before and I'm going to guide you into developing an application yourself and in today's video it's pretty much going to be a side-by-side -side guide in getting an application up and working with inside the platform. So, you're probably going to be asking, what's the benefit of developing an Overwolf application? Well, one, it can add additional value to games you already love or help new players. And on top of that, if you're smart and you develop something that's really great and really uh, massive contribution to the community, you can generate a great passive income off that as well. If you don't know what passive income is, it's something that makes money with you having very little input into. Now, obviously, the more success you want from your application, the more input you're going to have to put in as well. So what skills are you going to require to do this? You're only going to basically require HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Now, essentially, in today's video, I'm going to be covering TypeScript as well, which is an extension of JavaScript, but it's not essential, so don't let that put you off. This is also a great opportunity for you to learn some basic soft computer skills if you want to get into programming or web development or application development. So. I'll leave a few links in the description box below for the W3 Schools website, which will cover almost everything that you need to get going in today's tutorials. But that aside, what we're going to do first is get ourselves set up so we can get going. So let's get ourselves set up. Now, essentially, all I'll be doing in this section is downloading and installing software. Now, I find it quite monotonous when a tutorial is doing that. Um, just for completeness, I'm going to do it anyway, just if it helps people. Um, but for the most part, uh, if you want to skip this section, I'll leave links to everything I'm about to download and install in the description box down below. And I'll also leave a link to the next section, which is important, so don't skip that bit. So for the rest of you, I'll make this as quick and as painless as possible. I will speed run the installation process. So the first thing that we're going to need is the Overwolf application itself. So let's make our way to overwolf.com. In the top right hand corner of the screen, there's a big download Overwolf button. Clicking that will download a copy of the installer. Running it will then basically cause a prompt from Windows to basically say that this install needs write permissions to your local hard disk, which is a standard thing, so I approved it. Then the first step of the three step process of the installation, which language do I want to pick? English, next, pretty straightforward. I'm English, so I'm going to go with English. You can choose whichever language you want. Installation folder by default is already set. Um, I can't change it because I already have Overwolf installed. And then finally, I have read and accepted the Overwolf's terms and privacy policy. I haven't. Well, I never have ever read a terms and conditions or privacy policy. I don't plan to start now. But you can. It's up to you. Overwolf is already installed. Would you like to keep your existing apps and settings or discard them? Well, I'm going to keep them because I don't want to lose my WoW add-ons. Um, and the final step is basically just information about how Overwolf stores um, information on your machine in the form of cookies about advertising um, or adverts or how they will advertise to you. If you're not happy or you want to disable this, click manage and turn all the settings off, but I'm fine with it. Plus, I don't really want random adverts that aren't relevant to me. So... This shouldn't take uh, more than a moment to install, and once it's installed, you should get a pop-up of the Overwolf application, or the Overwolf application kind of homepage, which is also known as the App Store. If it doesn't, like me, and I have found that this doesn't happen if you have Overwolf already installed, it will just basically appear in your um, system tray in your bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So even though I've pressed launch, preparing to first launch, doesn't pop up, but it is in my system tray. Go away, extra icons, and then all you need to do is right click, click on the App Store, and now this is the Overwolf application ready and installed. From here, what you can do is log in or create an account if you don't have a pre-existing account. I'm not going to do it right now because I'm never comfortable logging in during a video. I'll do it off screen and then jump back to it later on. The next thing we're going to need is a copy of Node.js. I'd advise probably getting the current one. I mean, LTS is more really for people developing for commercial solutions possibly than, than just downloading the latest features. Now, I don't think this is going to work for me because I already have Node.js installed. So if it just brings up that it can only repair my installation, I will skip this actually because to install it, press next lots until it's installed. Um, yeah, I can't because uh, maybe change next, automatically install next, change. There you go. That's pretty much the installer. I went into a bit more detail with Overwolf because I can imagine a lot of you probably are coming to Overwolf from maybe a, a no background really with Overwolf. Possibly you could have a full experience of Overwolf and no experience with Node.js. So either way, 
no idea how long this is going to take. Well, it took that long exactly because I was going to skip it actually. Um, but let's finish that and now Node is basically installed. We can verify this. Go away. Go away. Ugh. Why is it still there? Uh, it's got to install extra stuff. I don't know why. Oh, chocolatey. Sorry, yes. When I installed the uh, node, I made sure that chocolatey was also installed. It's basically just package management uh, for updating node, if I'm correct. Um, you don't have to install it. It's just something I electively install just to keep my node up to date. Now, once it's installed, you probably it's probably worthwhile verifying your installation. Um, now, I actually have uh, a PowerShell to hand as well. Warning is very likely you'll need to close and reopen your shell before you can use Choco. Well, I'm not worried. don't worry about it. I'm not going to try and use Choco. As that's installed in Choco, what I am going to do is basically just show you the ver uh, how to validate your version of Node. Now, you used to be able to do it by just typing Node-V or Node-Version. Uh, For some reason, that's not working with the latest version. It could just be to do with my computer. But if I just do Node, it brings up the Node terminal, which then tells me that version 15.4.0 is installed. Okay, so cool, that's that set up. And the final thing that we're gonna to need to do and need to set up, again, I already have it installed, is Visual Studio Code. So let's download for Windows the most stable build. Now again, this is a very basic and straightforward um, task of pressing next until everything is installed. So license agreement, sure, whatever. <laughs> ah, sorry for my dog's whimpering in the background. Um, let's add a path. Let's make sure that the application is ready to install, preparing to install, and then it's just a case of waiting until it's installed. Now to validate this installation, what I'm gonna do is suggest opening it. And then hopefully it should just open without problems. Let's just hope I haven't left this open with something I shouldn't have uh, left open. Don't worry, nothing weird or rude or anything. I'm just talking about my work. Let's just hope that I haven't left anything uh, sensitive open. If I have, you might notice a cheeky edit to the video at this point. Uh, come on, installer. Go, right, there we go. Come on, Visual Studio Code, open up. Oh, it even opened up in a different screen. Actually, no, success. It's just the Overwolf code itself. I, I do prepare for these videos. Don't worry about it. But yeah, so basically this is just the Overwolf uh, Overwolf code base, and that's validate the, validated the installation of Overwolf. Now, we're done with installing, hooray! This is this part now where everyone else can join back into the section who may have skipped it. And what we need to do, once you've created an account or logged in, is get yourself uh, a whitelisted as an Overwolf developer. All that essentially entails is you going to overwolf.github.io making your way over to the getting started section once in the get started section which is the first option in the uh, menu at the top here go to submit app proposal now this doesn't essentially mean you're at the point of, of completing your app and ready to submit it it's ready to go on the store anything like that this is just okay i think i have an idea for an app that i want to start working on and you're basically stating to overwolf that you'd like to be whitelisted as well as a developer this is just more of a kind of a vetting process to one make sure that the overwolf platform is the right thing for you to develop this app on and kind of two is to kind of allow them to weed out any malicious people who plan to use yeah i want to use the overwolf platform to uh, wall hack as obviously they'll be like mm, maybe not maybe not you for now so all you'll need for this is a name for your app now again this isn't something that's set in stone this isn't a contract between you and the overwolf developers to say i have to create this app this is just your the name of your app now you could probably even say tbc for this um um, to be confirmed if you don't know what TBC is uh, and this is just basically just a way of them you know at least thinking that you have put some thought into this rather than just like you know what I'm just gonna go screw around with some stuff and then you just need to enter some standard stuff like your email your discord tag your username I'm sure you can read all this agreeing to more terms and conditions this is basically saying you won't use their platform for anything malicious as well as not trying to profiteer in any weird way you can profiteer but do it, uh, do it the correct way. Uh, your name, your app idea, again, just a brief of what you plan to do, what games you're gonna support, there's like Fortnite or whatever, or lots of games if you're gonna do a generic app, and then just a mock-up. Now, mock-up doesn't mean like, oh, and you need screenshots. A mock-up could be something like just open paint and just do some doodles. So again, it's quite relaxed, and to be honest, 
you're going to get a lot of feedback off the Overwolf guys, and not loads. You're not going to get pages and pages of essays about um, about what you need to improve or, or 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 suggestions there. And then how how did you hear us? Now I have done app suggestions before with the Overwolf. Now I used to do some app development with the Overwolf platform even before I decided to do a collaboration with them. So that, this isn't a biased opinion. I did find them very very easy to work with, and that's kind of why I agreed to do the collab with them. Uh, they're all really nice guys, really friendly. Uh, they'll always give you some key feedback whenever you submit an app. Uh, they'll be like, oh, do you know our platform can do this? And I was like, wow, I didn't. That's cool. I might try and incorporate that in my app. And and that's all essentially that this, this process is about. It's just like, uh, okay, I want to make a stats thing of this. Or like, okay, well, other people have done it similar. Here's what other people have done. Here's some ideas how they managed to make their app a real success. So, again, that's kind of all part and parcel of this um, the whitelisting uh, process. It's not about just trying to add a bureaucratic sort of stance to signing up it's just more about them being able to give you feedback and ensuring that you're trying to use the overall platform in the right way and that's basically it for this section so now that we're all set up let's get an app working. I'm going to take a step back to the Overwolf homepage and the reason I'm doing this is to kind of guide you through the documentation of Overwolf as well so from here we're going to make our way to the developers tab at the top and we're going to jump into getting started. Now, the reason I'm jumping into this is because Overwolf actually have an app that you can download and test with if you want to just see how an app works. And that app is just called the Sample App. It's written in kind of two languages. And I say two languages because there's two variations of it. There's a native JavaScript, which I'm sure a lot of you are quite comfortable with. And there's also a TypeScript. Now, for those who haven't ever really touched TypeScript. All TypeScript is, is a way of writing JavaScript with type um, constraints, essentially. So for instance, you're probably used to passing into a function a parameter that can be almost any value. Whereas with TypeScript, you have to define the value that's going to be passed into it in the sense that if it's a, a number, you have to state it's a number, string, object, array, and, and so forth. You get the idea. So without going too deep into TypeScript, because that's not really the sort of concept of this tutorial, let's jump into the sample app. And to get to the sample app from the getting started page, all you need to do on the left hand side menu, just click sample app, go to the basics. And then if you scroll down here a bit, it will basically take you through the instructions which I've already taken you through, install Overwolf, install Node.js, and then get you to this download the source code. So what you need to do is visit the repository, it's a standard GitHub repository, open source, everything visible. Go to the root of the app, and then you have the option to essentially download from this big code button here, for those of you who don't really know GitHub too well. If you click on it, you get two options. You can download, the, well technically you get more, you get the option to actually run it through command line as well, but I'm not going to go into command line for now. It is my preference, but I'll, I'll just avoid that for now. You can either download the zip, which I can imagine a lot of you probably just will do because it's the easiest approach to getting hold of that source code, or you can open with GitHub Desktop. Now, essentially with the zip, download the zip and extract it. That's all you need to do. With GitHub Desktop, which is what I actually prefer, just click the link. It will open your GitHub Desktop, and all I can do is just clone the repository to a local folder on my system, which is what I'm going to do now. And that's all that's doing. Okay, so now I have the uh, source code checked out on my local machine. So, what I'm going to do is open up uh, my Visual Studio code. Now, like I said, you, you could have electively uh, downloaded this before, or any editor that you, you're comfortable with. That's the main thing, is just be comfortable with the editor you're using. Right, so, now we're in Visual Studio code. We're actually in the directory. Um, like I said, there's two types of code here. There's the TypeScript version, which is under TS. Then there's the native version, which is just under kind of raw JavaScript. It, like I said, pretty much everything's here that you want. It's just all in that raw JavaScript form that you're probably a little bit more comfortable with. So if you want to explore and play, that might be your first step before you kind of take that jump into the TypeScript. But I'm going to just stick with the TypeScript for now, because for me, there isn't a massive difference. And, and if you get into TypeScript, you'll probably find that there isn't a huge difference between TypeScript and JavaScript because it's essentially the same language. And they all do boil down to JavaScript. So, 
the core thing is, and the core reason that I've actually jumped into this beforehand, is because I want to remove the in-game overlay to my desktop. And the reason I want to do that is because in this demo, it's easier for me to display the in-game overlay in a separate window to, uh, to Fortnite. So I'm not going to cover the manifest right now, but I will cover just how I plan to do that. So inside the manifest, there's a section here under data, and the data is basically how you, you, you basically structure your overall uh, windows per se. So everything is treated kind of as a, like a window. So as you see here, there's a section windows, there's background, desktop, and in-game. I don't want the in-game to actually be in-game, so what I'm going to do is move that to the desktop. And to do that, what I'm going to do is just simply get rid of this in-game only true and replace it with uh, the desktop only true and also make it a native window. And that's as much as you need to do. And like I said, I'll cover this in a bit more detail later on. And now what we're going to do is we're going to build the app. So the first thing that we need to do is kick up a little terminal. Now again, uh, hopefully this is big enough so everyone can see. I want to just check that my big head's not covering anything. I don't think it is. I think I should be okay. And all we need to type now is npm. Actually, no, no. First things first, we need to move into the TypeScript directory. So dd, uh, dd, cs, <laughs> the cd even, into ts. Then npm i. This is basically just shorthand for npm install. So if I run that, hopefully this won't take too long. Um, typically, I think it takes maybe about 30 seconds a minute, but that does depend on your internet connection and the general speed of your computer. I do have a relatively fast internet connection and a moderately fast computer. It's about four years old, but it's still so-so. Now, I have actually had a look in these um, NPM uh, warnings, where basically it's just saying, warning, uh, dependencies may have you know vulnerability. In this case, it doesn't say that. Just, just going to FYI point that out now. Um, it kind of just highlights things could probably do with fixing. I've looked into fixing these myself, um, and it's just basically unsupported platform issues. So ignore these for now. That that's my advice. Just ignore them. They're not they're not critical. If you even see two low severity vulnerabilities, it's not anything to worry about. Anyone who's just a bit security conscious, I'm extremely security conscious, so don't worry. So now we've actually installed all of the the basically the the dependencies of this package, we can now run it. And for those of you familiar with npm, obviously if you're running an npm command, it always originates from your package.json. So what we're going to be doing is running one of the two commands. Now if you see here, there's a folder here called scripts. And what we're going to do is first essentially run it through um, we're going to essentially just run the script through, sorry, we're going to run the script which is going to run webpack. And we're going to simply do that by doing npm run and then build. I'll cover the dev variation later on. The dev variation it basically allows us to modify the files and update in real time, essentially. That's all that that adds. But for now, I'm just going to build the application so we can just run it straight off the bat. So if I do npm run build, hopefully it should run and we should have a dist folder appear just like that. Okay, everything seems to be okay. We have seen a lot of green, which tells me that we're all good. Okay, so that's everything that we're going to need to do net for now. I'll come back a little bit later just to sort of reiterate um, what things are and explain a bit more into the structure. So let me now jump back. Over. You can see the changes I've made. Let me jump back a bit. So now we've actually downloaded our, our application, we've built it, it's now ready for us to run. But before we run it, we're going to enable some debug tools. So inside the docs, there is a section, so I've jumped a little bit ahead of myself there, uh, getting started, app creation, sub -creation, using our dev tools, that's what I was looking for. So it's a key thing to note that if you want to use the Overwolf dev tools, they changed um, how they actually work in, I think it was like 1.5.1 or 1.5.7, I think, um, that you basically have to enable them either by um, a command line command or the registry. Now, I find it, it's slightly easier just to do it the registry way. And you do that by, if you, let's just jump into the link, 
so you've got the command you can enable the overwolf um oh wait that's the disable feature there you go the overwolf enable features and then you can specify what feature you want to enable in this case we're trying to enable dev tools actually that's probably a better example than trying to use that up there so this is just basically a feature toggle system so you can enable the feature toggle enable dev tools but it's a bit laborious having to do that every time you run overwolf or having to create a shortcut to do the same thing it's easier just to update the registry so every time you run the application it's always going to be in sort of dev tools enabled mode now to do this it's basically a requiring a registry modification for those of you who are uncomfortable with running um, or editing your registry i do advise just running that command um, overwolf.exe, overwolf enable features, enable dev source. Now, if you want to do it along those lines, what you need to do is take a copy of the um, the executable, or the shortcut to the executable, sorry. Now, this isn't the actual overwolf.exe. This is actually the overwolf launcher. So you need to change that to overwolf. And then from this command, oh, wait, make sure that's overwolf.exe. And then also add this feature toggle switch at the end of it as well. So let's replace that from desktop. So we're basically also passing in the parameter overwolf enable features, enable dev tools, so forth. So that's the way that it's probably the easiest way to do it if you're not comfortable with the registry tools. But I'm going to cancel that because I don't want to do that. Let's even get rid of that too. And let's just jump into our registry. Now to edit our registry, standard reg edit. If you type reg edit, um, you get a prop up saying, are you sure you want to do this? because you can really screw up your operating system by doing this. Um, you can. So if you're going to follow me, make sure you follow exactly what I'm doing. Now they do have a, a path here laid out, or a node, should I say, to the registry that you're modifying. So you've got the HK current user, which is what was specified there. Then we're looking for the folder called software. Again, let's watch there. Then overwolf. As you can see, I've already been in this and checked everything out. And then from the overwolf node, what we need to do is create a new key and that is called CEF now from CEF you need to then create a registry key value or a sub value I forgot what they're actually called either way create the thing saying new string value now I don't know if this is zoomed out a little too much um, but I can't zoom in anymore unfortunately with my registry tool um, you'll just have to make sure that you follow this guide explicitly to the letter so in fact uh, no that should be alright so now that I've created my registry value let's just rename that to enable features and also let's modify the value itself so the value name is enable features and the value data is enable dev tools okay and that's in the directory CEF you can just make sure that tallies up so HK um, H key current user software overwolf CEF HK current user software overall CEF. Okay, so that's all done. You don't need to save it or anything like that, but you can take a backup of this if you want beforehand um, by simply going file, export, and then you basically export your entire tree if you want. So you can select the current branch and you just go, um, let's just back up everything in HK current user, for instance. But I'm a bit gung ho and I'm not bothered about that. So now that's done. If we close Overwolf, it's already closed, and relaunch it. Let's just make sure I'm launching the right thing here. Uh, yes, that's the right thing. I should now have my dev tools um, enabled so I can actually debug from, say, for instance, Chrome, which is what my actual general preference is. So let's just jump into our dev tools. Now, these dev tools will only be available to you if you are whitelisted. And it's all bound to your user and so forth. So if we go into about, I think there's a couple of ways to, to get to your development tools or your development options. I prefer this way just because it's easier for me. And then open development options. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to load an unpacked extension. Now, the difference between a packed, ex or a packed extension and an unpacked extension, an unpacked extension is essentially... Uh, a directory that's been zipped and called I think it's OPK let me just double check that I believe it's called an OPK file uh, nope uh, where are we let's just zoom in submit to your app it's usually under app submission 
Uh, yeah, OPK. So you got an OPK package over you. Now an OPK is basically a zip file with a certain file, like certain file structure inside it. But all it is is essentially just a zip file. Um, I'm not going to go too much into OPKs now because that's kind of a, a step way down the line after you've developed your app and you've already you're basically ready to get it on the store. So for now, what I'll do is I'll load an unpacked extension. So what I've got here is my GitHub sample app TS. Now you have to specify the TS directory as your unpacked extension. So once you've specified that, it's not your dist folder, it's actually the folder above because you need your it needs to be in the root directory where your manifest is. So your manifest.json should be in this directory. So if I select that, ooh, we have a sample TS. Very cool. Now we actually have an app loaded. Now this is just purely a Fortnite app. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see an action. And hopefully I've made the right edits so I can also see the um uh, sorry, so I can, <laughs> mine just wandered off there. So I can actually see uh, the in-game window on my desktop. That was what I was trying to get out there. We don't need to actually do anything now with Overwolf. I can actually just close all those things. And I can open the Epic Launcher, or the Epic Games Launcher. And what I'm also going to do is I'm also going to open a window to... Ooh, where's my... There it is. Let me just zoom in on this as well. So if you go to, let's go back, if you go to localhost colon 54284, this will only work if you've done that registry change that I've just mentioned and taken you through, and the same applies obviously with the command line uh, change or the shortcut change that I stated as well. So now I can see everything currently running. If I just open up my developer options again and launch this app, this app would automatically get launched the second I enter um, Fortnite as well, but I just want to show you in this as well. If I refresh that, ooh, we have two new sample apps. We have a desktop app and a background controller. So let's just jump in here and we can actually see everything in the console as well. Let's just zoom in a little bit, but not too much. I'll leave this at the bottom here. Let's get Fortnite launched. I probably should have done this before because it usually takes a minute or two to get going. Now this is just the sample app. This is actually the desktop window. This isn't the in-game window. The in-game window should show up the second the game launches because there is a rule that basically states that this uh, that that window will start when the game starts. But that's something in the manifest which I'll take you through once I've just shown you how the events basically populate the um, the application window. Come on, Fortnite, where are you? Depending on how long this takes, I might crop this out of the video. This is nothing to do with overall. This is just to do with how long my computer takes to start Fortnite. Anytime today. Come on. Oh, we're getting there. It's connecting. It's launching Fortnite. It's checking for updates. We have our in-game window pop up. It also closed, just a side note, it also closed the desktop window because obviously the, the idea of this is more to more for people with say like a single screen which has just gone full screen whereas obviously I've got multiple screens and I kind of I'm just managing windows okay so let's play Fortnite okay all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna spin up a, a well, close that I don't care a battle lab just because it's easier for me just to show things with let's move you over here you can already see there's a few events actually come through so far I don't think there's actually anything being thrown out to the console log yet, surprisingly. Um, I can check if anything else is going out to the console log. I can probably see um, in-game events. Essentially, this is like all in-game events. This isn't just Fortnite, if I'm correct. The, uh, what's that called? The event game event provider. So, let's just launch a battle lab and hopefully I can start seeing some more events coming through. So, let's launch a battle lab. Now I'm just going to play on my own because, well, one, I'm completely terrible at Fortnite, and two, I'd rather not embarrass myself. Um, so what we're going to be looking out for here, see, straight into loading screen, we're going to be looking at the types of events that we're going to be able to capture. So stuff that we can essentially do stuff with. Let's just land somewhere. I'm going to land exactly wherever I am right now. So let's just land here. Let's go into this warehouse as well. There we are. 
Now, let's just jump back over to the window here. So you've noticed here that I have a quick bar enabled the pickaxe. So any time that I change um, an element on my quick bar, I'll basically have an event kicked off for it. So let's just destroy this. As you can probably see as well, there's lots of events coming through every time I collect things. So if I jump back into here, you can see that the metal item data count is increasing. So 196 to 224 and so forth. So if I collect these two items, this ammo and this assault rifle, you'll also see those two events as well. Let's just expand this a little bit more. You're not seeing anything from this because I don't think there's any console logs, but you should be able to see all the events coming through here too. Now, if I change weapons, kind of like I mentioned before, the quick bar um, event should trigger as well. Okay, so cool. We've seen the trick, uh, the trick bar, the quick bar update. We can also see other events such as um, our aim, or sorry, our aim, our accuracy levels every time we take a shot. So if I jump back to the events, you can see total shots five. I think there was an accuracy. Yes, there is an accuracy. So I've got an accuracy of 1.0, which means I'm 100% accurate at hitting things. Let's just take a few shots elsewhere and hopefully drop my accuracy. There we go. We've got an accuracy now of 0.933. So if you wanted to just basically keep an eye on the average player's accuracy, you could actually have a like a little display in the top right saying your accuracy this game is at 27%, which would be amazingly high for me. I think there's an event as well for looting crates, or is it just for picking... No, it's not for looting crates, it's just picking the items up. That's my mistake. But everything I've picked up there has also been enabled. This also works for buildings too, so let's just build something. Let's build a ramp. Okay. There isn't, I was mistaken. It actually is just an update for the fact that I've used materials. So every time that I modify or change my material count, you should see an event trigger through to basically state exactly that. My raw, raw materials are now dropping. So that in a nutshell is the kind of things you'll see. Now obviously you're going to see things when players attack you and you take damage, you players kill you, or you kill other players, or you do damage to other players, you'll see all of these type of events coming through. Obviously I'm only on like um, a, a test realm, should I say now, and you're not really seeing those sorts of things. I if there was one for destroying that. Never checked before. No, there isn't. Either way, those are the kinds of events you can do. Now, obviously, this applies to just more than Fortnite. This is going to apply to things like Dota, League of Legends, PUBG. I no PUBG. I probably should have done this with PUBG because I know that better than anything else. Um, there isn't as a ton of games. They there is actually a complete list of games, and I'll leave a link to the description below, uh, in the description below, of all the games that this is currently supporting. And that, in a nutshell, is all the events. So let's take a look further onto the application itself and let's start breaking down that source code. So I'll just do a quick transition into a, a cleaner window with the source code prepared. And with a little bit of video editing magic, we're now back in our code editor. Okay, so there was one thing that I didn't touch on in the previous segment, and that was the two types of game events. So when you're listening for game events, you want to listen to the game info, is what I showed you, and that's just a collection of aggregated data as well as just general events. And then the game events um, themselves, they sometimes duplicate into the game info, but for the most part, they do have their own unique presence where there'll be things like you taking shots, you getting killed, you taking damage, and so forth. But enough about that, let's jump into the um, sample apps code stru code and its general structure, and which will basically cover a general structure of an application as well. Now I'll start with the manifest file, but before I do, I'm not going to go too deep into it because there is a complete document on the entirety of the manifest on the Overwolf developer website. And I'll leave a link to it in the description down below, and the reason why I'm not going into it too much is you can already see how big that page is. I'm just going to cover the basics. So I'll just sweep over a lot of these. So manifest we don't really need manifest version we don't really need to know too much about for now. Let's just use version one, type web app, um, meta. Meta is just information about the application within the Overwolf platform itself, like icons, name, um, minimum version of Overwolf requires. So if you're developing an app that requires a set version of Overwolf, you need to specify that so you can maintain that functionality um, throughout all the versions. You also have um, permissions. Now permissions are key to making sure that you can 
uh, access the things that you require. Now, for instance, you saw the game info events, which is one of the things that you require uh, for to run this app. Uh, but you, what I didn't show you was the hotkey um, permission. Well, I didn't really show the hotkey permission, but I also didn't show you hotkeys within the app. Let me just open the Overwolf um, event. Uh, sorry, the Overwolf settings. So what I'm doing right now, you probably can't see it, so I'm right clicking on the task icon and going into settings. You can do that from the main menu as well. Now, the top menu option here is overlay and hotkeys. Now, you'll notice here our sample TS, which is our application, has a show hide in-game window, which we can control with control and G. That's not default. Um, if you use hotkeys properly, you can actually allow the user to define what these uh, events are. So if I go back and set it where it should be, I can just go control F and that's now set back to what it was. But like I said, the user can define it. Um, auto launch off, as you saw when we launched the game, it automatically launched the in-game version of the app. We can turn that off as well if we want to by just simply toggling this button. I'm gonna leave it on for now. And that's essentially what those hotkeys are about. So let's jump into now the data segment. Now the data segment is the kind of um, applications definition. And what's in there is your structure in Windows. So every time that you saw like um, the window on the desktop or the window in game, even though I made it on the desktop, it had a definition of a window. So if I just break those down into the three different types of windows that we had, we have a background window a desktop window and an in-game window. Now the start window is the background window and what I'll do is I'll correlate them to code as we're going through them. So with the background window, essentially what we're t calling there is that we're gonna be using this file or this template or whatever you wanna to refer to it as, dist background background.html, which can be found in the folder dist background background.html, which is essentially just this file. It's a pretty much just a simple static HTML file with a reference to a background.js. Now, what that is, is basically, if you've ever come across something like an Electron application, an Electron application is just a, a standard desktop application that's driven exclusively from HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's the exact same principle that's used here. So you don't have to worry about thinking, oh, do I need to know C Sharp or C++ or any other programming language? You just need to know HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and then you're good to go. So what we're stating with this background, um, this background page, though, is that it is a background page, and we don't actually see anything. That's why the HTML for it is very bare bones and basic. And we're only just referencing one JavaScript file and doing nothing else really with it. We need a title really though, so we can actually have some reference to it and, and have some something to reference when we're seeing the, um, the debugger in the browser like I showed you. And that's pretty much all you need. Now the background HTML is the thing that controls the whole application. So without it, the rest of the application doesn't function. It's always important to have your background controller. So I'm going to jump into the background.ts, which is the TypeScript, uh, the TypeScript for that controller. Hopefully this isn't too complicated for you. Um, all it's doing, in a nutshell, is, let me just jump down to the instantiation, it's calling background instance.run. Now, there should only ever be one instance of this background controller. So what they have done, or what the Overwolf developers have done, is create this function called public static instance, which is basically a singleton design pattern to make sure there's only ever one instance of this object. And then once that's done, it's calling the run. Now, in the uh, the instance, it's initially initializing the constructor, which is defining your two other um, windows, desktop and in-game, and it's creating basically a wrap around them called um, Overwolf Window or OW Window. And then from there, it's ha it's basically controlling how, what to it essentially displays. So if we jump back down to run, you can see that the current window is, if Fortnite is running in-game, if it isn't running, it's using the desktop. So for instance, I have the app running at the moment. If I open the current app window for it, you can see it's the desktop window because the application, uh, the overall, overall, the Fortnite application isn't running, so therefore it's default into the desktop window. And this is the same, obviously, if I were to have the app, if I were to have Fortnite running, it would then use the in-game window. And it would also toggle it based on the certain event that is game running, isn't game running, and so forth. As you can see here, toggle window. So it's just checking to see is the game running. Uh, if it is, close it if, and then restore. So it is, sorry, it is running, close the desktop, open the in-game, and then inverse of if it isn't running, close the in-game, open the desktop. And that is essentially all it's doing. So that's a very simple sort of controller. 
So if we now go and take a look into our desktop application. Now our desktop application, again, very sort of similar structure, except we haven't got this notation of is background page because we actually want it something to display. So obviously the background was something that we're not going to display, but it's a controlling factor to the whole application. The desktop um, controller, or the desktop window, is kind of like a, um, just more of a display and a welcome and so forth, like we can see here. There's not really much you can do with it. But let's just take a quick look at some of the uh, properties that we've got set in the manifest. We've got desktop only true, so it can only be a desktop based window, it can't be an overlay in game. It's a native window, so what we're saying by native window is it's got a standard subset of controls in the top right hand corner you can see here, like every standard Windows based application minimize, maximize, close, so forth. We're saying it's resizable, it's transparent, it's override and update, which if I'm correct, is simply means it updates the data when an event happens. And when I mean event, what I mean is like if the window gets, say for instance, resized, the data then gets um, overridden uh, per se. Then just some basic things like size, um, min size and so forth. So let's just take a quick look into that source as well. So the same sort of thing inside our dist, desktop, desktop.html. We have a bit more in here. We have CSS, we have some content as well, some images and so forth because our application is visible. So we need something to display. So that's why all of this is there. But obviously ultimately at the bottom of this, um, you've got the JavaScript. So you can see here that you can add analytics, for instance, you've got your Google Analytics there, um, some external links to um, other applications, and then you even have some internal links to specific Overwolf events. So this is kind of a good example. You can create a link saying Overwolf column forward slash forward slash settings hotkeys, which then should take me to the settings hotkey, which if I'm right, uh, it's in the settings. There we go. So as you can see here, these are the settings. And sorry, I got that inverse. The native control basically means that um, we're allowing, is that correct? We're allowing the application to control. Yeah, we're allowing the application, sorry, I got the, the wrong way around. We're allowing the application to control the input. So we're saying that the, the input controller is native to the actual window itself. So essentially that's what these are, the social links and also the tooltips and the window control and minimize, maximize and close. Sorry, my mistake there previously. So essentially that's what that is. Now if we take a look at the desktop.typescript, all it is is an app window because there's nothing functionally happening behind the scenes, we're just kind of acting as a display entity. And then finally, let's take a look at the manifest and the in-game window. Now I've reverted my changes here, so it now displays in-game only true, which basically means it's an overlay to the game that you're overriding it on or you're using it on. We've also got a couple of events here like focus uh, takeover release hotkey, which is basically allowing our show hide mechanism to work with our with our hotkey. Um, resizable true, transparency true, override and update true, size min max. So all the, 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 the general gist of things that we had previously. Um, so let's just take a look at our ingame.ts. Now this has got a little bit more than what we previously had in our desktop version, but not that much more. So similarly to the other version, you've got this uh, control at the bottom, in-game instance run, which then runs through the standard singleton design pattern, and then run, and then what it's doing here is just um, initializing a game events listener. So what it's doing here is calling Fortnite game events listener start. Fortnite game events listener is just defined here in the constructor as an overwolf game events listener, when we're listening to new events and info updates. And all it's doing there is we're passing the entity this to it and when it receives an event, so the Overwolf game events, let's just take a quick look at that, Overwolf game events, which I think it's this one. When a game event occurs, what we're saying is call the delegate method um, on info updates and also on new events on new events. So let's just look for that within our ingame.ts. So we should have two methods, and yes we do. We have on info updates, and what we're doing is simply logging a line to that window that I showed you um, for both scenarios. Now, there's obviously a different window. We're going to the info log, or which is the one in the center, uh, for the info updates, which is what I showed you. Then for the new events, we're going to the events log, which is the one on the left-hand side, which I forgot to show you. But that's only listening for kill, death, assist, level. So we're only we're filtering there on certain events for actually happening. And that pretty much in a nutshell is kind of that 
that controller. There is obviously the, the, the set toggle hotkey, which is your event to um, toggle the display of that window by just obviously pressing your hotkey event, your log line, which is just printing stuff out, and that's pretty much it. The last thing I'm going to cover in the manifest, because you've got just some definitions of the hotkeys, um, uh, other pages you can access, such as the Overwolf um, website and Google Analytics and so forth, and some developer uh, reload tools and so forth. Um, the only thing that I feel like is core cool to mention on this now is your game target, game events and, and launch events. So your game target is basically going to be dedicated to the game ID 21216, which is Fortnite. Your game events, which is what events you're going to be listening for, again, is 21216, again, Fortnite. And your launch events, which is going to listen for when the application is launched. We're looking for event 21216. And it's also specifying that will this start minimized. We're saying no because we want, obviously, that overlay to actually appear in-game when we launch it. Obviously, you can change it so it's not, and you could toggle the user, and you could make the user toggle your overlay to be off by default, and then they can toggle it on and off, and so forth. And that, in a nutshell, is what I'm going to cover with the manifest. Now, there is probably some other things that is worth looking at. So, in the odk.ts, if I'm correct, that's Overwolf's development kit. This is just a simple set of um, libraries that they've provided with the sample app. You don't have to use these if you choose not to. You've also got your constants.ts which is kind of useful because these are the events that we're going to be looking out for. Counters, death, items, kill, killed, killer, location, match info, match me, phase, so forth. Um, then you've just got some basic definitions of the windows, uh, hockey definition, show hide, and the Fortnite class ID which is obviously what we've mentioned in the manifest.ts, uh, manifest, manifest.ts, manifest.json which is 21216 obviously Fortnite. There is, um, there is obviously some more stuff you could look at, your package.js which is just some uh, definitions of packages we're using, uh, obviously this application is being built with using WebKit. If you wanted to add um, a watch to your application, so for instance if you were editing in real time and you wanted to keep things update, you could run um, npm run dev. So any time that you make a change to any of the files inside of your application, it will automatically rebuild it and it should automatically update in real time, which is great if we want to just basically just change some stuff. It is worth noting that if you make changes to the manifest or how the game's launch at the background, you do have to restart the application you're building with, but for the most part, if you're just making small in-game changes, so let's just go and make a change to, where is our Windows? So background here. Um, let's just, uh, for instance, one thing that we didn't have actually was our in-game, and this is what I was looking for, is our events logged into the console. So let's just find one log line. What's in the log line? Oh, it was actually logged to the console. I was just looking at the wrong window. So let's just delete those, just as an example to show you the, um, the web app update and see I've just edited that. It's now rebuilt all of the application. So the next time that it basically, or it should or hopefully automatically reload in game, and then it should reflect the changes almost instantaneously in the game, or obviously in the app while playing the game. And I think that's all I'm going to cover in regards to that. I don't feel like it's worth going into too much more. You can look at the Webpack uh, structure if you want. I'm not a big fan of Webpack personally. I prefer using Gulp for my um, my sort of continuous integration tools or build tools, should I say, in this in this instance. Uh, there is the TS config. Uh, it's basically just an outline of your TypeScript configuration. Um, there is a reference there to your node modules overwolf types, which is a type definition for your overwolf. Um, your root directory for source codes, excluding uh, changes to your node modules, or no, sorry, excluding building of your node modules when um, building your TypeScript, unless referenced. And I think that's pretty much it for the code wise. I don't feel like it's worth mentioning too much in your native app because basically that will do the same thing. Again, you have your manifest.json, does pretty much the same thing. You've got some uh, HTML, uh, some native JavaScript scripts this time instead. Um, it's all basically the same thing, just native JS, nothing too fancy. Probably not as nice to read as the TypeScript, but there we go, that's what it is. And yeah, that's pretty much the code. That's going to wrap it up for me today. Now, hopefully, this has been interesting enough that you've not been too burnt out. And if you do need any more information with your apps, don't forget, Overwolf guys have a forum 
Reddit, Slack and Discord where they can answer all of your questions. There's also the Overwolf documentation like I've referenced multiple times today. All of this in the description box down below. I, to be honest at this point the links in the description box down below is probably more than you're ever going to need. I'm also going to include a couple of links to apps that I've developed on the Overwolf platform. And I'm going to start with one that I did submit, but due to an issue with the PUBG developers, I had to detract the application. The problem was the application itself added an unfair advantage to players, which obviously the developers of the game weren't happy with. And Overwolf works very closely with a lot of game developers to not basically upset them too much and make sure that it doesn't detract from the quality of the game. So that's unfortunately why my app never quite made it to the store. It's fully complete and I'm releasing all the source code, even to the point of the store listing descriptions, the screenshots, and it even has a tool that will build your OPK for you. You have all the screenshots of what the app looked like, how it functioned, everything, even design documentation to come with this app. So this was quite a comprehensively built app. So if you're interested in seeing what an app looks like just before it's about to hit the store, Again, there is a link for that. There's also an alternative link to another app that I started um, called the Apex Legends Stat Track. Again, links in the descriptions down below. This is all open source. It's Apache license. Don't worry, I did put a license with every single one that if you want to just take all this source code to use as a base for your own application, you are more than freely welcome to. And that's going to be it for me today. Now, if there is enough interest, what I will do in the future is put together a series of these of build an app with me, where I will fully get an app from start to finish on the store, and you can join along with me while I do it, so you can learn loads of stuff about developing, not just the Overwolf application, TypeScript, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. So, like I said, if there's enough of that interest there, I'll do it. But until next time, I'm going to see you around.